It is a real honor to be with you. I want to make sure you can hear my voice. I'm writing a new book about great power competition today, relying on lessons from the Cold War and the last time we had great power, power competition in the world in the 20th century. And, and I want to be clear, this is a work in progress. Uh, I've been working on this book for several years, including multiple stays in, in Beijing. That's the Stanford campus. Uh, that's our Stanford Center, SCPKU, for those who haven't been. Next time, hopefully sometime in the future, when uh, China opens up to us again, uh, we look forward, to, I'll do this talk again uh, with all three of us, uh, with uh, our audiences at Beida. But it's still a work in progress, despite having been working on it for many years. Um, I know the American part of it pretty well. I served in government, and this book is primarily about American foreign policy. I know the Russia piece pretty well. It, the book focuses on China and Russia. Uh, the part I know the least about, of course, is China. And so as you'll see in my remarks, I've learned a great deal from my two colleagues and, and from all of my colleagues here at Stanford over the last several years and working on this, but I do not feel qualified to talk about the intentions of Xi Jinping or the Communist Party uh, or, their, or the government of China. And therefore, for this talk today, I will more be more focused on outcomes, what they're actually doing and not pretending that I can understand intentions. But I say that at the outset because I want to provoke you to help me understand intentions. We have a ton of expertise in this call today. And so I am pleading with you, uh, including with my email at the end, uh, to help me, guide me, and help me rethink some of the hypotheses and arguments I'm going to make and help me discover new sources and new research and new things I should be reading. So it's a two-way street today. It's not just me performing, it's you helping me write a better book. Just so everybody knows, uh, the book is owed to the publisher December 31st at the end of this year. So I've got six more months to go. All right, with that introduction, let me, let me start. <clears throat> and let me remind you, if we, if we were talking 20 years ago, the old conventional wisdom was that China was a rising country seeking to join the liberal international order. That conventional wisdom now in my country, and I want to just be, keep saying that, I know we have an international audience, uh, keep reminding you I'm speaking as an American focused on the American policy debate today. I'm not an expert on the Chinese debate or, or international debates. Um, <clears throat> but I think it's fair to say there's a new conventional wisdom now here in the United States with very variations on the theme, and that is we have entered a new Cold War with China. Uh, some have been making this argument for years, some have been making it recently, and I want to say at the outset, I think both of these arguments are wrong. Or to put it another way, a more diplomatic way, both of these arguments are partially right, but neither one of them on itself uh, tells the complete story. And if that sounds nuanced, that's exactly my point. That's exactly the point of my talk today, that this is a nuanced relationship, that it's has some attributes like the old Cold War, some not. Some of those attributes are good for stability and some are not. And, and to diagnose the, pro, uh, the, the situation, the bipolar relationship with China, uh, in other talks I would add Russia, but today I'm just gonna focus on China. Uh, to get it right requires nuance and not black and white pictures in order to then uh, prepare um, the right strategy from the American perspective for how to deal with China's rise. So that's my bottom line up front if I run out of time. All right, and just to remind you of some of the things that people have been saying for a long time now, notice some of these dates are from 2018, everybody, new Cold War, new Cold War, Cold Warriors. Uh, here's a cover from 2019 of The Economist, so it's not just the Americans, our British friends are talking about this as well. Um, I think the 2017 national security strategy drafted uh, in large measure, by the way, by our Stanford colleague at the Hoover Institution, H.R. McMaster, and his deputy at the time, Nadia Shadlow, uh, was a major pivotal moment in rethinking how to engage and contain, engage and cooperate, cooperate, uh, uh, deter, compete with China. Uh, but it was a it was a departure. Uh, I think if you look at our 2012 national security strategy, 
I said our because I helped to write that when I worked at the White House for uh, President Obama. This was a pretty dramatic departure in terms of thinking of the challenges that the United States face. Um, and in the last year of the Trump administration, there was just a full throttle, you know, many, many speeches, long documents trying to frame this debate uh, in, in, I in, in my opinion, in Cold War terms. And, and I'll just let you read the quotes and you decide if you think I'm right or wrong about that. This is the National Security Advisor uh, talking about Xi Jinping as being the successor to Joseph Stalin. Um, here is uh, the Secretary of State saying that China is working to take down freedom all across the world. Um, but here's also Secretary of State nominee, uh, Tony Blinken, now Secretary of State Blinken, uh, emphasizing continuity and not disconnect with some of the analytic uh, statements and analytic revisions that the Trump administration made with respect to US policy towards China. Um, likewise, I encourage you to read then candidate Joe Biden, now President Joe Biden's piece in foreign affairs where you'll see continuity, at least some continuity. And most recently, we have the honor at, at Stanford at FSI and APARC to host uh, Kurt Campbell uh, and his deputy, Laura Rosenberger. Uh, Kurt, for those of you who don't know, is uh, his formal title as Deputy Assistant to the President and Coordinator for Indo-Pacific Affairs at the National Security Council. Others in the US government call him the China czar. Uh, that is to say, he is the point person uh, with respect to policy development and implementation towards China and the region. And in this talk, he said very bluntly, the period that was broadly described as engagement between the US and China has come to an end. That was just a few weeks ago. So I think, as I said, I think some of that is right and some of it is wrong. Uh, and what I wanna do for the next 10 minutes is do a compare and contrast between similarities between the Cold War and differences, and then talk uh, if I have time, and I'm gonna to try to be brief, about lessons from the Cold War, both positive and negative, that we can learn from in order to avoid some of the worst moments in the Cold War. And, and at the end, ah, maybe I'll end on that. Uh, I have a few more slides. We'll see how time goes, whether I talk about the long-term uh, power relationship between China and the US. OK, first on the similarities. I think there are some similarities here. And for those that say that our current relationship with China has nothing to do with the Cold War, I want to say very bluntly that I think that's wrong. I think there are some similarities. Uh, here's the list. You can read them as I talk. Um, number one, we are not moving to a multipolar world, as some argue. Uh, I think instead you have two superpowers emerging uh, in front of the pack. And I want to be clear about this. Others are rising as well, right? Uh, I'll talk Russia is rising, by the way. Russia is not a declining power. India is rising. But if you think about this as a, a track meet, I used to run the two miles, so I used to do this uh, um, as a kid. Uh, there are two front runners that are way ahead of the pack on most dimensions of power. And I'll show you some data on that uh, later in my talk. The United States is ahead, but is still pulling away from the rest of the pack. I think this, this, there's a common misconception that the United States is declining and China's rising, it's actually, if you can see my hands, the United States continues to rise. China's just rising at a faster pace. So uh, when I ran the two mile, I, was, I always liked to be out front. I, I used to go to the front. Uh, it's an eight mile, uh, eight lap race here in the United States. I used to like to be in the front already by lap two. And then I would spend the rest of the race trying to keep in front. Um, and, and every race, there would be a challenger that would close the gap uh, and in ninth grade, none of them caught me, by the way. I went undefeated in ninth grade. But every race, there was somebody uh, closing in uh, to close the gap. That's the model I have in my mind about the two superpowers, not a multipolar world. Second, uh, it is a global competition on the economic stage, just as it was during the Cold War. Third, 
There is ideological competition between China and the United States. One is a democracy and one is an autocracy. And just that very fact makes both sides nervous about each other. The Chinese leadership is nervous about our democracy and our power behind it. And likewise, our leaders are worried about Chinese autocracy and power behind it, no matter how much happy talk and detente and let's, let's, let's pretend that ideology doesn't matter. In my view, while those two regimes are different, there will be some degree of tension uh, as there has been throughout most of, of the last hundred uh, and I would even go back 150 years between democracies and autocracies. Uh, fourth, um, this is important, both China and the United States seek to propagate their ideas abroad. Uh, I'm going to tell you in a moment that it's not equal in that way, but the United States is an ideological power. Uh, just listen to President Biden when he speaks about this. He is unabashedly talking about supporting democratic ideas, not just in the United States, but abroad. And likewise, Chinese leaders uh, propagate uh, their ideas about governance and the economy. And then finally, my prediction, this is just a prediction, is that like the Cold War, this competition will last for a long, long time. So that's on the similarity side. But now there are some really, really important differences. And let's just, I'm not going to go through this entire slide because it's uh, got a lot of different points on it. You can just read it and look at it. But let me highlight four that I think are really important in terms of differences. First, I just told you that there's an ideological contest and it's real. But now I want to tell you that it's not as intense as it was during the Cold War. And in particular, if you look at what the Soviet Union was doing to export communism, including through ideas, through radios, through training, sometimes through military force, there's none of that intensity uh, with respect to what Beijing is doing around the world. That's probably the most uh, 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 controversial point that I'm making tonight, by the way. There are many people in the US government and, and, and China experts that disagree with me. But when I look at what Stalin was doing, what Lenin was doing, Khrushchev, Brezhnev in that history, and I see uh, the effort they put to propagate Marxist-Leninist regimes abroad, I do not see the same intensity from the CCP around the world today. Second, very different from the Cold War, our economies and our societies are much more intertwined between China and the United States compared to the US and the Soviet Union during the Cold War. Some people see that as a problem. I see it as a solution. I see it as a positive thing that might help to avoid some of the confrontations and, and including military confrontation we had during the Cold War. Third, we are not fighting proxy wars around the world like we did during the, uh, the Cold War. I actually hate the term Cold War, just so you know, uh, because it wasn't cold. Millions of people died during the Cold War. Millions of Chinese, millions of, of, of uh, people in the developing wor world where we fought these proxy wars, and, and also many tens of thousands of Americans died fighting proxy wars with the Soviets. Russians died too. Uh, that is not happening today. That's a good thing in terms of uh, how we're different. And then finally, this is more of a question mark, but during most of the Cold War, there was, except late 60s, early 70s was maybe a, an exception, but most of the time it was pretty clear you had a bipartisan consensus in the United States that we were the leader of the free world or the liberal international order, and that to contain the Soviets, we had to maintain that leadership in the world. And I would just put a question mark with comparing to today, I don't see the same bipartisan uh, consensus about that. I see some very isolationist tendencies, primarily in the Republican Party, but also uh, in the Democratic Party. And I'm not sure over the long term whether that will um, uh, continue and deepen. And if it does, that's a pretty radical departure from the Cold War. All right, um, I think I'll skip this complex. I'll come back to this. 
and just flag, uh, if you want to come back to it in questions, that in comparing and contrasting to the Cold War, from my perspective as an American, some things are more challenging today that are similar, and some things are more challenging today that are different. And likewise, some things are less challenging today because they're similar with the Cold War and less challenging today because they're different from the Cold War. And that, again, that complexity, I want to keep reminding you, that's because it is complex. And oversimplifying it, I think, is, is very dangerous, at least to American foreign policy. And I somewhat worry the same is true with respect to Chinese foreign policy. All right. So what can we learn then both to avoid and to emulate from the Cold War in terms of US-China relations today? Um, four points about what to avoid. First, threat misperceptions. During the Cold War, we thought the Soviets were more powerful than they actually were. Uh, most this first happened with the missile gap, but it, it goes all the way through. If you go back and you read the literature in the 1970s, uh, when the Soviet Union was reaching nuclear parity, there was lots of concern about power parity across the board. And in retrospect, those turned out to be, um, uh, you know, just bad analytic assessments. Uh, the Soviet Union collapsed 15 years later, but in real time in 73, 74, 75, we had a misperception of the threat. From that misperception came some very, uh, in my view, some tragic things that need to be avoided uh, today in US-China relations. One is McCarthyism. Uh, you see, see a spike in anti-Asian um, uh, activities, uh, both from society, and I would even say sometimes from the, the government, uh, we do not need to repeat McCarthyism uh, to compete and engage with China in the 21st century. Uh, Vietnam War, the idea where we conflated nationalism and communism, and we had an expansive notion of global containment, uh, that turned out to be a giant radical mistake, in my view in the Cold War. We did not need to fight the Vietnam War to win the Cold War. Uh, that needs to be avoided in the future. And conversely, on the, the Chinese side, I think one of the critical mistakes that Soviet leaders made is that they believe that evolutionary partial political change in Eastern Europe uh, was uh, threatening to their regime. And I think they made some critical mistakes. Hungary, 56, Czechoslovakia, 68. Poland in 8081, where those interventions, I think, helped to undermine uh, Soviet legitimacy uh, decades later. Second and related, overreach. Uh, the Soviets, their, their greatest overreach, of course, was their invasion of Afghanistan. Uh, to remind you, at, at one point, Brezhnev talked about Afghanistan as becoming a 16th Republic of the Soviet Union. And he thought it'd be easy. You just use some military force and install and support the Marxist-Leninist regime there. In many ways, I think that led to the downfall of the Soviet Union. Uh, and likewise, related to the Vietnam War, I think our idea of fight, uh, uh, supporting quote unquote freedom fighters all over the world, Afghanistan, Angola, Nicaragua during the early 80s uh, uh, was unnecessary and led to us supporting some really, you know, trying to think of a more diplomatic word than creepy crawler, but really horrible people uh, uh, that later came back to haunt us in terms of our own national security interests. Third, this is, uh, I'm thinking more about America here than China, um, but in the name of containing the Soviet Union, we embraced all kinds of horrific leaders and regimes that in retrospect, I think was a huge mistake. We did not need to support apartheid in South Africa to win the Cold War. Uh, we did not need to support the coup in, in Chile uh, in, in uh, uh, Pinochet uh, to win the Cold War. And I see some echoes of that similar mistake with respect to US policy around the world today. And then fourth and finally, things to avoid. Uh, and here I'm thinking mostly about China, but maybe about the United States, depending on how our domestic reforms uh, evolve in the next several years. But in the 70s, uh, especially in the Brezhnev era, I, I mean, during the Brezhnev era, um, uh, as the Soviet Union became powerful, 
and equal in many measures to the United States, Leonid Brezhnev, the general secretary of the Communist Party at the time, focused on adventurism abroad and forgot about domestic reform at home. And, you know, I spent time in China and I, I interact with Chinese uh, scholars, including even at the, at the party school back 20 years ago. I, I think the first time I had a meeting there was 30 years ago, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, I went there with uh, Min Chin Pei, by the way, Pei Min Chin, if you know him. Um, and there's a lot of interest in China about the Gorbachev era. In fact, my book on the collapse of the Soviet Union uh, has been translated into Chinese, and I think it sold more copies there uh, than it has in the United States. It was published in 2001. But I want to encourage Chinese scholars to not just think about the Gorbachev era. I think you need to think about the 70s and the period that's called Zastoy in terms of comparisons uh, that I think uh, might be more apt. Uh, but then finally, or maybe penultimately, I'll, I'll show you really quickly some power slides in a minute, compare and contrast. Um, but I also think there are some positive lessons from the Cold War that should and could be emulated today in terms of US-China relations. First, we learned to cooperate and confront simultaneously with the Soviets. Took us a while to figure it out, but we figured out eventually in the 70s especially that we could work on mutual interests. So we got rid of smallpox together. We signed the Non-Proliferation Treaty. We signed arms control agreements. We did the Helsinki Accords. We cooperated in space all the while as we maintain this ideological competition in other parts of the world. I think that's an important lesson for US and Chinese officials today. And second, and maybe even more importantly, because both Americans and Chinese leaders have not been doing this recently, and our Chinese colleagues have really never practiced this before, uh, but in the later decades of the Cold War, we developed mechanisms to reduce misperceptions and misunderstandings, crisis management, crisis prevention, contacts between our civil societies, track two dialogues. And here in the United States, we invested a ton into understanding the Soviet Union and the countries in the communist bloc. Uh, I'm a product of it. I learned Russian and Polish as a result of government investments uh, to train people like me I think there's a really important lesson for both of our societies uh, on all of these mechanisms, but especially for both societies to understand the other society. Uh, I, there are some fantastic American um, specialists in China, but there are very few of them. And likewise, we have, a, we have some fantastic China specialists uh, in the United States, including a great group at, uh, here at, at uh, Stanford, including some on this call, but I don't think there's enough of them. And I think knowledge about the other is a way also to reduce misperceptions and misunderstandings. Um, and that leads me to two concluding, um, maybe I'll go on for five more minutes, but a couple of things I worry about uh, before ending on an optimistic note. I worry that we overestimate Chinese power I worry that we overestimate the PRC's commitment to exporting Marxism-Leninism, which I see no evidence for. And I even think we overestimate their support for exporting autocracy, uh, although that's a very contested hypothesis uh, here in the United States. And third, I think we are underestimating the cost of a Cold War 2.0. Uh, people just forgot how, mil how many millions of people died in the Cold War and how much money we wasted building ICBMs uh, that we've never used, how much money we wasted preparing to fight a nuclear war and a conventional war against the Soviets that was, I think, not you know, proper allocation of American resources. Uh, so those are my worries on the American side. Um, my concern about the bilateral uh, are two things. Can US and Chinese leaders get used to living with both geopolitical and ideological tensions? Uh, we had to during the Cold War, but it wasn't easy. Uh, I have a bitter experience of trying to, to manage competition and cooperation at the same time uh, with Russia when I worked in the government. Um, and we did for a while under President Medvedev, and it fell completely apart when President Putin came back to the Kremlin uh, when he was reelected in 2012. Um, 
And I, I just find it's, it's an easy slogan, competition and cooperation at the same time. It's actually quite hard to manage those two streams of activity at the same time. And then second, I, I, I'm speaking here more about the American side, but I think it's a challenge for Chinese leaders as well. Can we avoid framing every foreign policy issue through the lens of great power competition? I think for my country, that would be a giant mistake uh, because I think there are other problems in the world uh, where A, we need China to cooperate and B, they may have nothing to do with China. And I don't want us to like force everything through the lens of competition with China. Uh, I saw a little bit of that, by the way, on the president's trip to Europe uh, at the NATO summit where you know the China challenge was there. And I, I wanna be clear about this. The China challenge is the most important foreign policy priority for the United States for the rest of the 21st century. It's just not the only foreign policy priority for the rest of the, of, of the century. And NATO, for instance, has a real problem on its hands with Russia. Why don't we just have NATO focus on that problem and let other allies fo focus on security matters in Asia as an example of, of too much twisting. Uh, and there, you know, this is something we did during the Cold War, and I think we did it and we made mistakes when we did it. And then second, will linkage impede cooperation? I think are the most successful leaders during the Cold War from the United States. And at the top of my list would be my former colleague, George Schultz, uh, when he was Secretary of State, avoided linkage. They dealt with issues in their lane. They did not link them together. And I'm just not confident that either Xi Jinping or President Biden uh, will be able to do that. Uh, because of the nature of domestic politics and the nature of seeing everything as linked together. Um, I think I'll just leave that for now and I'll bet I want to come back to that in questions if you're curious about it. All right. Um, oh my goodness. Let's skip this then. Maybe I'll end. Uh, I, as an American, actually I'll just race through these Hungbin so that people, if they want to come back to it in questions, I talked longer than I was planning to. But as an American, given what I've just said, um, I, I just want to caution that in the long term, I think there are many dimensions of this relationship that should make Americans more confident than I sometimes think we talk about these things. Um, and to this, this notion that, that, that China is taking over the world and that, that you know, we're back to the Cold War, I, I just think there's a lot of evidence to suggest that that is a premature conclusion. So let me just race through these as a teaser and then get to your questions. First on military power. We're still the biggest dog here, folks. Nuclear power, we're way ahead of China. We're way ahead on, on the weapons, on conventional power. We're still way ahead of China. Uh, again, I'll, we'll, we'll circulate these later, but on almost every dimension, we're still way ahead. We're still ahead on allies. Very important. We are not dealing with the China security threat, the military threat alone, we have allies all over the world, uh, uh, much more so than either China or Russia. Economic power, and here I, I tiptoe because I'm with two economists now, um, but you know, yes, China's catching up in terms of GDP, and, and if you count uh, in different ways, PPP, they're already ahead of us. Uh, that, is, that is true, and that trend, will, they'll definitely catch us. But if you add up the rest of the world, just remind you, nine of the 10 largest economies in the world are democracies. 17 of the 20 uh, in the G20 are democracies. Um, almost all of those countries, by the way, allied with us. On GDP per capita, we are still way ahead of China. China, it'll take the rest of the century for China to catch up to us on this dimension. Um, and here it is, China's 69th. You know, we're eighth in GDP per capita. And China has a lot of big problems coming. And I highly recommend this book, uh, one of the most influential books that I've read in recent years about China, thinking about the challenges that you, go, that you face when trying to go from a middle income country to a high income country. We have top universities here, including the one I'm speaking at right now. Uh, large companies still doing rather well. China's rising, but we are too. Uh, this one, this is from a paper that Hong Bin did. Uh, this worries me the most because I know 
because it's, it, the, the trajectory here is so sharp. Um, and thinking about AI and R&D, also the trajectory here is sharp. And I think this is a dimension of competition that demands real attention. Uh, AI, I'm gonna go quickly through this for now because this is pretty detailed stuff. Um, so I do think that that is a piece of it, but in aggregate, you know, I, I, you, would you rather be China or the United States? With regard to military power, economic power, I think I'd rather be the United States. And then third, ideational power. I would just like to remind everybody that when you survey people around the world, most people, uh, citizens, not governments, prefer democracy over autocracy. Um, and then finally, leaders matter. And we've had a change in leadership and already very dramatically has changed the way the rest of the world thinks of the United States. Look at those numbers. In just a few months, we have radically changed the way that the world thinks about uh, the United States. Um, at the same time, the views of Xi Jinping have been going in a very negative direction over the last uh, several years. The question mark, of course, is whether Biden is the return of a tradition of liberal internationalism that we've had for many decades, or if he's the last hurrah and that Trump was actually the beginning of a long-term trajectory towards unilateralism and isolation. And the answer to that is I just simply don't know the truth yet. And then finally, very finally, finally, I apologize for going on. I just like to remind pe the people that say the United States is over and done is that we've had this debate in our country before when things looked really bad for democracy and really bad for the United States. And we've always found a way for renewal. So the 30s looked pretty bad. The 50s looked pretty bad to remind you and the debate when China fell about you know, who was responsible for the rise of communism. The 70s looked really bad when lots of countries were, were um, uh, changing government to Marxist-Leninist regimes. Even the 80s, we had a giant debate about uh, uh, Japan. And it was just a question of time whether we were gonna be overtaken by Japan. And I don't wanna predict the future, but I wanna tell you that in all of those predictions about American decline, they were wrong. And therefore, I think it's premature to talk about permanent American decline uh, today. And with that, I'm done. Thank you for your patience. Please send me your thoughts and your emails and your comments either on Twitter or email because I'm still, this is a work in progress and I look forward from learning from all of you in the future. Thanks, Mike. Thank you. So far, such a dynamic, fantastic talk. Uh, I think there are already so many questions. I don't think I can read every question. So I'm going to combine all the questions together. So the first question is, the many people in the audience are Stanford alums. So, so one set of questions is about what would be the Stanford's role uh, at current US-China relations? So what can the faculty students, alumni do? There are two very specific questions. Can we maintain our regular normal exchanges between two countries, which is important? for academics. Uh, second, should Stanford educate Chinese students? Is it good or bad for US national interest? So. Right. So those are hard questions and I don't pretend to have easy answers, uh, but let me slice them up in three different ways. First, uh, more so than anything, um, as somebody who knows Washington pretty well, uh, who knows the think tank world there. Uh, I, I think we need more knowledge about China as a country. Uh, I, I get nervous about groupthink and consensus. Um, uh, I, uh, you know, there's a reason I work at Stanford and not in the think tank world because the think tank world's too close to power. Uh, you know, they're, they're thinking about the next meeting with the president of the United States and, and a policy prescription. And, and don't get me wrong, there's a, there's a place for that. But there's also a place for empirical research so that we know what's actually going on in China that is not somehow tainted by, you know, having, getting invited to the next policy meeting by the, the Biden administration. And this was a really important role that places like Stanford played during the Cold War. 
uh, you know, if you go back and you look at the Cold War debates, as I had, there was there was a lot of groupthink in the 50s, too, by the way. They was scary. Everybody thought the same thing. And it was only when we opened the aperture and we had policy debates uh, based on research that made our policy better. And, and I want to be clear, this is not a Democrat Republican thing. This, that, and for God's sakes, it's not a hawkish, dovish thing. Those labels distort science. They don't help science. They don't help understanding. Uh, I really, uh, there's nothing that drives me more nuts than hawk versus dove. As somebody who's been uh, described as a hawk for most of my career, uh, I want people that are knowledgeable about uh, China versus those that are not. Uh, and I think that is the main role that Stanford should play, especially on issues where it's very difficult to know what's going on inside China. Hung Bin, I'm looking right at you. You're, the kind of research that you do is very difficult. That's the kind of research that Stanford needs to support so that we have an informed debate and not a kind of shallow debate uh, that, that I, I just fear it's, it, it needs to be a deeper debate. Um, that's number one. Number two, I do not believe that science has a passport. Uh, you know, when I put together my syllabus for my class, I don't check to see, you know, what's the citizenship of the people that we're reading. Uh, I just finished teaching in the spring. Um, and, you know, there were Iranians, Chinese, Russians, uh, Brits, Germans, and Americans, and even one Canadian, uh, you know, on my syllabus. Uh, I think this idea that we're going to put citizenship to science is, uh, I think is extremely dangerous. Now there is some knowledge that should be classified and has national security uh, implications should it, it circulate. And that's why we have classification. That I worked in the government. I used to, be, uh, you used to have access to the most classified information in the, in the United States government. Uh, and that work needs to be done and that work needs to be classified. And that's the job of the US government. That's not the job of Stanford. To the best of my knowledge, we do not do classified work at Stanford. Uh, I don't think we should. And therefore, that's how you disaggregate that. I want Chinese students to be educated at Stanford. I, this, this simplistic notion that it's somehow helping them, I, I think that's very short-sighted um, for lots of different reasons. Um, not least of which is we want people in China to know the United States. Uh, the more they know about the United States, the better it is, I think, for the United States. I think we've got a great product to sell uh, called the United States of America. I want as many people around the world, not just Chinese, but, but Russians and Iranians, to see and experience that. I think that helps to advance America's uh, national security interests. And then third, this is more delicate, but I think track to dialogues, interaction between uh, academics, you know, we do have this incredible facility at Peking University. Um, during the Cold War, those track to dialogues uh, turned out to be extremely important for informing both of our governments uh, and, and, and dialing back some of the misperceptions, especially like on nuclear weapons. Uh, and, and some of our Stanford colleagues were involved in that. I think that's another very important role that we at Stanford are uniquely positioned to play. Uh, you know, track 1.5 dialogues, track two dialogues. And, you know, as I used to always say in the government, two things, just talking to somebody doesn't mean you, you agree with them. Uh, I supported President Biden meeting with Putin, not because I, I want them to be friends, but because I want them to understand each other. Um, and the worst thing in diplomacy is to allow for confrontation or let alone conflict based on misperceptions or bad information. Uh, and I think that's, a, that's something that we as a university can help reduce in terms of the debate here in the United States. Yeah, thanks, Mike. So there's another question about uh, the Cold War. Uh, the, I think there are several questions. So basically, how uh, well informed are Americans about the Cold War? I mean, so many people use the term. Do they really know what it means, actually? Uh, it's a great question. Whoever answered, asked that question, I thank you for it. 
because most Americans have forgotten about the Cold War in two very dangerous ways. One, we won the Cold War, right? We won. So, so people think, well, let's go back to the Cold War because we'll win again. Um, and and some, some people even argue, some elites even argue, we need the Cold War with China as a way to unite America again. Because uh, we were united in the Cold War, we had a common enemy. And by, uh, you know, uh, making this a self-fulfilling prophecy of a Cold War 2.0, we can bring Democrats and Republicans together again. And there are a couple of problems with that. Number one, we did not win the Cold War on our own. Russians won the Cold War. Ukrainians won the Cold War. Estonians won the Cold War. East Germans won the Cold War. The notion that we toppled these uh, uh, communist regimes is just inaccurate. Uh, it's wrong. It's a, it's a wrong perception of what happened. We facilitated some things, but the main drivers of the end of the Cold War were inside those countries, not outside of those countries. Number two, um, as I said before, because we won the game, right? I, I sorry for the metaphors with sports, but um, uh, for the, the Stanford uh, people out there, and I know there are lots of you. Tomorrow, I'm I'm recruiting for the Stanford football team in the morning, uh, so I, I'm I'm working with my metaphors about why they should come to Stanford, um, uh, uh, and and you know, once we get to the end game, then it's like, well, we won, and so we won, but we forget about all the mistakes we made that were really costly. And I think many Americans have forgotten about those mistakes. And that, that scares me, especially about those that, that think we just need to go back to that uh, as a way to win again. And then number three, you know, a big difference um, between China and the US today is the interconnectivity between our economies and our societies and, and, and Hong Bing, people like you and me, for God's sakes. Like, you know, there were not that many Soviet scholars that worked uh, globally. There weren't that many Soviet students. Um, and, you know, there are parts of connectivity that have gone too far, in my view. And I support limited decoupling. I think that's right for national security purposes. Um, at the same time, you know, uh, learning from the Cold War, uh, two things are important. Complete decoupling is highly irrational. Uh, the notion that, you know, do, does it really affect America's national interests uh, for a BRI project in, I don't know, Ghana or a, a 5G project in Rwanda, and that we have to put all of our resources to stopping those things. I do not think that is smart. And that's what we tried to do in the Cold War. And we wasted a lot of energy and resources with global containment, that doesn't make any sense. But second, there are places where cooperation still serves America's national interest. So, you know, uh, if I think of like the semiconductor industry, and, and now I feel like, uh, you know, I should turn it over to you guys, but uh, complete decoupling will be bad for American companies. Uh, complete decoupling would be bad for Boeing. Boeing sells a lot of planes in China. Uh, and I think we have to have a much more nuanced Th way to think about that question than we did during the Cold War. Thanks, Mac. I think we are so lucky. We have uh, the top two Russian expert on campus, you and Kandi. Yes. So uh, the next question is uh, about, I mean, so what are the areas for potential collaborations between two countries? And what are the major risk areas? So Taiwan is asked several times. So is Taiwan a major risk factor? for the relationship between two countries? Yes. So, um, you know, on cooperation, I would say, you know, on, on the multi-world, multilateral world, we have to cooperate, you know, climate change, pandemics, non-proliferation, and we should not link um, uh, that multilateral cooperation to things where we disagree. Uh, to me, that's a mistake. Um, we also should not check our, in my view, American foreign policy. We also should not check our values at the door to cooperate on things that are, serve our interests. And, and again, I highly recommend George Schultz's uh, memoirs for how you navigate uh, uh, that, that 
that tricky combination of cooperate bilaterally and multilaterally when it's in our interests, contain, uh, the, the, the Biden administration likes to use the word compete, but, but I'm not afraid of the word contain when we must and not check our values at the door uh, when we interact. Uh, and I, you know, all, the, all those lessons are same for, for Putin's Russia, by the way. It's the same thing in my view. Now, having said that, um, uh, it also means not to overreact, uh, you know, and, and to see, you know, uh, Marxist Leninists in, in, on our, in Silicon Valley or, uh, you know, in Africa, uh, everywhere we turn, right? That, that I want to keep emphasizing that, that, that uh, containment, this was a debate they had, by the way, in the early stages of the Cold War. Um, and my uh, predecessor, uh, uh, he, he was the ambassador to the Soviet Union, George Kennan, he lost that debate. Kennan argued for um, uh, a kind of moderate containment, not global containment. He thought that was more in our, our interest. He lost that debate. And I think it's important to go back and study that debate again for how we deal with China. With respect to Taiwan, to me, without question, uh, uh, Taiwan is the, the major moment, the major flashpoint in um, uh, uh, an issue that could, could go from a, you know, a cold peace that we're in now to a con conventional war that would be disastrous for China, the United States, and of course, the citizens of Taiwan. And um, I'm not an expert, so I want to I want to emphasize that. Uh, and and we have experts at Stanford. In fact, our colleague Oriana Mastro just wrote a very interesting piece about Taiwan recently in Foreign Affairs. But to me, the great success of the last several decades has been the peace uh, with respect to Taiwan, China, and the United States. Um, you know, nobody ever writes books about non-events. Uh, but the great non-event of, of the last 30 years was the non-war over Taiwan. Um, and I firmly believe that a, uh, a management of that issue is the most important issue in bilateral relations. My own view, uh, from American point of view, is that we need to make more credible our security, guarantee, our security relationship with Taiwan. We've had this policy of ambiguity. I think that that's over. I think we need to be more credible on that. But we also be, need to be more credible on not supporting independence. So for me, I want, I want more clarity on both of those uh, fronts in terms of US foreign policy. And likewise, I would like to see more uh, clarity from uh, um, Beijing, from Xi Jinping uh, about uh, a credible commitment that uh, the, the Chinese government will not use force for reunification. Um, and here, I just think there's a very important lesson, you know, and this, uh, Hong Kong's on my mind here, uh, just so you're, so I'm clear, not Taiwan maybe in the future, but Hong Kong right now. Uh, you know, the Soviet Union uh, during World War II did annex some territory. Uh, you know, they some of it they called reunification or not, but, uh, you know, the Baltic states, for instance, uh, they became part of the Soviet Union after World War II. And for many decades, uh, they were part of the Soviet Union and it was, people thought it was stable. But I'll tell you, I visited uh, Estonia in 1985 and I was completely shocked that I was in the Soviet Union because those people did not accept Soviet rule. Uh, and uh, it, was very, it was very palpable to me that these people were not going to accept living in the Soviet Union. It took decades, but it's very hard once people have gotten used to living under freedom that they then accept uh, autocratic rule. And I think studying that part of the Cold War would be very useful for uh, Chinese scholars. I think Mike has given, uh, I think, a great uh, comparison between the Cold War and the current U.S.-China relations. I think the China-U.S. relations, I think probably will be the most important foreign relations in this century. And there are still a lot of questions we don't have an answer. I can see that there are like almost 100 questions from the audience today. So, so I know today's time is short, 
But I think I do hope we can invite Mac uh, to come back again after you finish your book at the end of the year to share with us again uh, about uh, your view about China and US-China relations. Uh, I will hope all have enjoyed this session and uh, we hope uh, you, you can have a great, great summer. Uh, after the summer, uh, in September, we are going to have another event. Uh, and maybe Tina can show the uh, slide. Uh, so Professor Barry Norton from UCSD uh, will talk about China's economy. So if you don't know Barry, Barry is, is one of the top leading scholars uh, studying China's economy. Uh, and he will share with us about China's industry policies, trade, and also uh, uh, very important demographic issues. Uh, again, thank you so much for uh, tuning in today. I hope all of you have a great summer. I hope to see you soon.